Dear friends in the risen Lord Jesus, last Sunday we celebrated the cornerstone of our faith as Christians, the resurrection. We celebrated the supreme proof that love conquers hate and that life has the final word, not death. Today being the second Sunday of Easter, the liturgical readings invite us to reflect on the consequences of the resurrection event in the life of the followers of Jesus. In the first reading from Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 16, the apostles are attested to have continued with the ministry of Jesus, carrying out deeds of power, wonders, and signs among the people. Although the apostles will soon also get into necessary trouble with the authorities, for which many were afraid to join them, the people held them in high honor, and multitudes believed, bringing their sick, Confident that even if Peter's shadow alone should fall on them, they will be healed. And indeed, the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits were healed. Clearly, therefore, the resurrection was a transforming experience for the apostles. Earlier, the apostles could not perform any deeds of power. They could not even cast the demon of epilepsy afflicting a boy brought to them while Jesus was on the Transfiguration Mountain together with Peter, James, and John. At the crucifixion, Peter denied knowing Jesus three good times. But thanks to the resurrection power, the apostles are now transformed into fearless preachers and workers of wonders. Peter, who had denied knowing Jesus, is now a spokesman, raising his voice to address men of Judah and all who live in Jerusalem, announcing Jesus as the one whom God has made both Lord and Messiah, working many signs and wonders, healing the lame man from birth at the beautiful gate, and much more. As we continue to celebrate Christ's victory over the forces of death and hate, we are called upon to reflect on what that implies for us personally and as a community of believers in the risen Lord. We must ask ourselves whether we are now more determined than ever to continue to make real the legacy of Christ in our time. Our second reading is from the book of the Apocalypse, Revelation. At the beginning of the book, the author John tells us that this book is an Apocalypse Jesu Christo, a revelation of Jesus Christ about things which must soon take place. The book has different layers of mysteries of revelations that require good knowledge, especially of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, to understand those revelations. John was writing to the seven churches in Asia Minor, namely Ephesus, Simina, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, all in present-day Turkey. Our reading today begins from verse 9 of the first chapter. Let us highlight a few points from the reading. First, John is undergoing the same sufferings as the other followers of Jesus Christ, but he is on the island of Patmos. It is believed that John was banished to this island of Patmos by the Roman authorities as punishment during the Roman rule of Domitian in the first century. Therefore, John suffered persecution like the other Christians in the Roman Empire. The second point is that the vision John describes happened on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day refers to the day of the resurrection, which we now call Sunday. That is important because it draws a link between the vision of John and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Third, he heard a voice asking him to write to the seven churches we had already mentioned. 
Then when he turned, he saw seven golden lampstands. The imagery of the seven golden lampstands goes back to the Old Testament, the menorah in the temple. Read Exodus chapter 25, also read 1 Chronicles chapter 28 verse 15. That means that John was within the temple, the heavenly temple. Fourth, amid the lampstands was one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash round his waist. The description of one like a son of man goes back to the vision of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7 verse 13, a title that Jesus appropriates to himself in the Gospels. He is the son of man. And the imagery of the long robe and the golden sash depicts the dressing of the priests, Aaron and his sons, which then became the high priestly dressing. Read Exodus chapter 29, 5-9. So Jesus is the ideal high priest, as the letter to the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, 14 to 15. But much more than that, the vision also depicts Jesus as the ancient of days, as we see in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. That is a reference to the eternal existence of Jesus as the Son of God. Fifth, John fell to his feet at this beautiful sight and Jesus told him not to be afraid because he is, that is Jesus, he is the first and the last, the living one who died and now lives forever and has the keys of death and Hades. Death did not have the final word on the cross. Jesus has the keys of death and Hades. Hades was a place for the dead, a temporary vision for the souls awaiting judgment. In Hebrew this place is called Sheol. Jesus goes to Hades to liberate the souls that were awaiting judgment. Before Jesus went down there, Hades was thought to be under the control of Satan. Keys are symbols of authority. By his death on the cross and resurrection, he has the power to liberate people from Hades or leave them there in death. Satan has no power over us anymore. Jesus has the keys. Why should we be afraid? As long as we entrust our lives to Him and allow Him to be the Lord of our lives, we are assured of living with Him in eternity. Today's Gospel is from John chapter 20, which narrates the account of Jesus' resurrection. It began last Sunday with verses 1 to 9 about Mary Magdalene, Peter, and the other disciples visiting the empty tomb of Jesus. Then Mary encounters the risen Christ in verses 10 to 18, the first person to experience him. On this Divine Sunday, today's passage, verses 19 to 31, presents the first two appearances of Jesus, eight days apart, to his disciples gathered behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. Some points to note in these encounters are, first, Jesus is no longer subject to or bound by normal space conditions or human limitations because of his resurrection. Twice, with the doors locked, he appears to his disciples and spends time with them. The same way, Jesus breaks barriers to reach out to us always. Second, Jesus greets them with a typical Jewish greeting, Shalom Lecha, which means Peace be with you. This greeting of the risen Christ significantly impacts the disciples hiding in dread and confusion. Shalom, as we know, does not simply express the absence of war as peace. It carries the Hebrew meanings of peace, health, well-being, completeness, prosperity, success, wholeness, and salvation. It is a complete wellness package that Jesus brings to his disciples who were living in fear, in humiliation, and limitation. Third, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The act of breathing on harks back to Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 when God breathed into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life to complete the creation of man. And in Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 9 when the prophet called to the, to the spirit to breathe into the dead bones and let them live. 
The Spirit completely infused new life into the lifeless bodies in both cases. Jesus, in the same way, breathed upon his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. In Hebrew, the word spirit is ruach, which means breath, wind, or spirit. So Jesus breathed the spirit of life on his disciples, consecrating them with the power of God's spirit to forgive sins, since only God could forgive sins. By this, Jesus instituted the sacrament of penance for all sinful members of his church. They can now seek forgiveness in confession and be absolved of their sins. When the priest forgives the penitent sin, heaven is in accord and the sins of the individuals are forgiven. Fourth, Jesus tells Thomas to put his fingers in his hand and his side, saying, Do not be faithless, but believing. Thomas's doubt represents the typical attitude of many who cannot believe without seeing miracles. Miracles should not be the primary catalyst for believing in Christ. Rather, his words, which are spirit and life, should have the power to convince and convert. However, Jesus still offered the evidence to Thomas, and he believed and said, My Lord and my God. Jesus then blessed those who do not wait for miraculous evidence to believe. He said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. The entire episode of Jesus' appearance to his disciples after his resurrection is an expression of his love and mercy to humanity. Because of his love and compassion, he transcends human limitations to bring us peace. He breathes the Spirit on his apostles to effect pardon for sins, and he comes to strengthen and to bless our faith. On this Divine Mercy Sunday, may we truly appreciate the gift of Christ's resurrection and live our lives as the Easter resurrected people. Happy Divine Mercy Sunday to you all, and may God's divine mercy always be with you. Amen. The Devar Adonai team thanks you for listening, and may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. To follow our reflections for Sundays and solemnities, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow our Facebook page, Devar Adonai, or visit our website, devaradonai.org.